The epic invasion that changed the course of the Second World War was the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. The invasion, known to be the Battle of Normandy, which lasted from June 1944 to August 1944, resulted in the Allied liberation of Western Europe from Nazi Germany's control. Codenamed Operation Overlord, and often referred to as the D-Day, the battle began on June 6, 1944, when over 150,000 American, British and Canadian forces landed on five beaches along a 50-mile stretch of the heavily fortified coast of France's Normandy region. The invasion was the largest amphibious military assault in history. Without the brilliant planning and heroic sacrifices of the Allied statesmen, military strategists, and combatants, the Allied may have never defeated the Nazi forces in Europe. The operation that would cause the Allied forces over 10,000 casualties and 4,000 deaths on the first day began the liberation of France and later Western Europe and laid the foundations of the Allied victory on the Western Front. By the end of August 1944, all of northern France was liberated and the invading forces advanced into Germany, where they would eventually meet with Soviet forces advancing from the east to bring an end to the Nazi Reich. This film conveys, from both sides' accounts, the war between the Allied forces and the German military over the control of Western Europe, particularly the areas bordering France, a battle that significantly changed the tides against the favor of Germany in the World War II. Prelude to Operation Overlord In midsummer 1943, a year before the Anglo-American invasion of Normandy that would lead to the liberation of Western Europe, Adolf Hitler's Wehrmacht, armed forces still occupied all the territory it had gained in the Blitzkrieg campaigns of 1939-41 and most of its Russian conquests of 1941-42. It also retained its foothold on the coast of North Africa, acquired when it had gone to the aid of its Italian ally in 1941. The Russian counteroffensives at the Battle of Stalingrad and the Battle of Korsk had pushed back the perimeter of Hitler's Europe in the east, yet he or his allies still controlled the whole of mainland Europe, except for neutral Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, and Sweden. On May 26, 1940, the British implemented Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of Allied forces from Dunkirk, as the German army advanced through northern France during the early days of the World War II, it cuts off British troops from their French allies, forcing an enormous evacuation of soldiers across the North Sea from the town of Dunkirk to England. The Allied armies trapped by the sea were quickly being encircled on all sides by the Germans. By May 19, 1940, British commanders were already considering the withdrawal of the entire British Expeditionary Force BF, by sea. Hundreds of fishing boats, pleasure yachts, lifeboats, ferries and other civilian ships of every size and type raced to Dunkirk, braving mines, bombs, torpedoes and the ruthless airborne attacks of the German Luftwaffe. During the Dunkirk evacuation, the Royal Air Force RAF, successfully resisted the Luftwaffe, saving the operation from failure. Still, the German fighters bombarded the beach, destroyed numerous vessels and pursued ships within a few miles of the English coast. The harbor at Dunkirk was bombed out of use, and smaller civilian vessels had to ferry the soldiers from the beaches to the warships waiting at sea. But for nine days, the evacuation continued a miracle to the Allied commanders and the rank-and-file soldiers who had expected utter annihilation. By June 4 the same year, when the Germans closed in and the operation came to an end, more than 338,000 soldiers were saved. In the days following the successful evacuation, the campaign became known as the Miracle of Dunkirk. And so, the Americans entered the war in December 1941, and by 1942, they and the British, who had been evacuated from the beaches of Dunkirk in May 1940 after being cut off by the Germans in the Battle of France, were considering the possibility of a major Allied invasion across the English Channel. The following year, Allied plans for a cross-channel invasion began to ramp up. In the years which followed the fall of France, the Germans publicized the building of an Atlantic Wall against any invasion attempts on the part of the Allies. In his speech announcing declaration of war on the United States, Hitler said, December 11, 1941 A belt of strong points and gigantic fortifications runs from Kirkens, Norway, to the Pyrenees, it is my unshakable decision to make this front impregnable against every enemy. In November 1943, Adolf Hitler who was aware of the threat of an invasion along France's northern coast, appointed Field Marshal Owen Rommel in charge of spearheading defense operations in the region, as Inspector of Coastal Defenses and then as Commander of Army Group B, occupying the threatened Channel Coast, even though the Germans did not know exactly where the Allies would strike. Hitler charged Rommel with finishing the Atlantic Wall, 
a 2,400-mile fortification of bunkers, landmines and beach and water obstacles. As Army Group Commander, Rommel officially reported to the longer-serving Commander-in-Chief of the West, Gerd von Rundstedt, though the entire structure was locked into a rigid chain of command that deferred many operational decisions to the Führer himself. Earlier on, the German forces, having already invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, instigated the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, who began pressing his allies for the creation of a second front in Western Europe, a more reason why the Allied needed to carry out the cross-channel invasion. Therefore, in late May 1942 the Soviet Union and the United States made a joint announcement that a full understanding was reached with regard to the urgent tasks of creating a second front in Europe in 1942. However, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill persuaded U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt to postpone the promised invasion as, even with U.S. help, the Allies did not have adequate forces for such an activity. And so in the Second Washington Conference, Argonaut, by June 20 to 25, 1942, Churchill and Roosevelt met to make first priority, opening a second front in North Africa, then postponed the cross-English Channel invasion. Instead of an immediate return to France, the Western Allied staged offensives in the Mediterranean theater of operations, where British troops were already stationed. By mid-1943 the campaign in North Africa had been won. Following the outcome of the Third Washington Conference, Trident, on May 12 to 25, 1943, the Allied then launched the invasion of Sicily in July 1943 and subsequently invaded the Italian mainland in September the same year. By then, Soviet forces were on the offensive and had won a major victory at the Battle of Stalingrad. In the Tehran Conference, by November 28 to December 1, 1943, the Big Three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, physically met for the first time to plan the final strategy for the war against Nazi Germany and its allies, and set the date for Operation Overlord. The Allied planned to launch the invasion on May 1, 1944. The initial draft of the plan was accepted at the Quebec Conference in August 1943. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was appointed commander of Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. General Bernard Montgomery, the German Rommel's desert opponent in North Africa, was named commander of the 21st Army Group, which comprised all land forces involved in the invasion. Operation Overlord The decision taken at Tehran was a final indication of the Allied determination to stage the cross-channel invasion. Yet despite Alan Brooks, Churchill's chief of staff, procrastination, the British had in fact been proceeding with structural plans, coordinated by Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan, who had been appointed Cossack, chief of staff, to the Supreme Allied Commander, designate, at the Anglo-American Casablanca Conference in January 1943. His staff's first plan for Operation Overlord, as the invasion was henceforth to be known, was for a landing in Normandy between Cannes and the Cotentin Peninsula in a strength of three divisions, with two brigades to be airdropped. Another 11 divisions were to be landed within the first two weeks through two artificial harbors that would be towed across the channel. Once a foothold had been established, a force of 100 divisions, the majority shipped directly from the United States, were to be assembled in France for a final assault on Germany. In January 1944 Eisenhower became Supreme Allied Commander, and the Cossack staff was redesignated SHAF, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. Two years of planning and preparation led up to the Allied landing in Normandy on June 6, 1944. British and American staffs had to work out every foreseeable detail for an undertaking that would involve the major military resources of the two Allied powers, immense stocks of shipping, aircraft, and supplies were assembled in the British Isles in an effort that taxed the war industries of both countries. After much deliberation, it was decided that the landings would take place on the long, sloping beaches of Normandy. There, the Allies would have the element of surprise. The German high command expected the attack to come in the Pas de Calais region, north of the River Seine where the English Channel is narrowest. It was here that Adolf Hitler had put the bulk of his panzer divisions after being tipped off by Allied undercover agents posing as German sympathizers that the invasion would take place in the Pas de Calais. Therefore, in the months and weeks before D-Day, the Allied carried out a massive deception operation intended to make the Germans think the main invasion target was Pas de Calais, the narrowest point between Britain and France, rather than Normandy. In addition, they led the Germans to believe that Norway and other locations were also potential invasion targets. Many tactics were used to carry out the deception, including fake equipment, a phantom army commanded by George Patton and supposedly based in England, across from Pas de Calais, double agents, and fraudulent radio transmissions. Surprise was an essential element of the Allied invasion plan. 
If the Germans had known where and when the Allied were coming they would have hurled them back into the sea with the 55 divisions they had in France. The invaders would have been on the offensive with a 10 to 1 manpower ratio against them. However, the challenges of mounting a successful landing were daunting. The English Channel was notorious for its rough seas and unpredictable weather, and the Germans had spent months constructing the Atlantic Wall, a 2,400-mile line of obstacles. This defensive wall comprised 6.5 million mines, thousands of concrete bunkers and pillboxes containing heavy and fast-firing artillery, tens of thousands of tank ditches, and other formidable beach obstacles. And the German army would be dug in on the cliffs overlooking the American landing beaches. Meanwhile, at the Tehran Conference in August 1943, Allied leaders scheduled Overlord to take place on or about May 1, 1944. In the meantime, they prepared ceaselessly for the attack. Trucks, tanks, and tens of thousands of troops poured into England. We were getting ready for one of the biggest adventures of our lives, an American sergeant said. We couldn't wait. Meanwhile, the American and British air forces in England conducted a tremendous bombing campaign that targeted railroad bridges and roadways in northern France to prevent the Germans from bringing in reserves to stop the invasion. The invasion would be supported by more than 13,000 fighter, bomber, and transport aircraft, against which the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, was able to deploy fewer than 400 on D-Day. Between April 1 and June 5, 1944, the British and American Strategic Air Forces deployed 11,000 aircraft, flew 200,000 sorties, and dropped 195,000 tons of bombs on French rail centers and road networks as well as German airfields, radar installations, military bases, and coastal artillery batteries. 2,000 Allied aircraft were lost in these preliminaries, but the air campaign succeeded in breaking all the bridges across the Seine and Loire rivers and thus isolating the invasion area from the rest of France. The Luftwaffe staff was forced to concede that, the outstanding factor both before and during the invasion was the overwhelming air superiority of the enemy. The air campaign was designed not only to disrupt German anti-invasion preparations but also to serve as a deception operation. Two-thirds of the bombs were dropped outside the invasion area in an attempt to persuade the enemy that the landings would be made northeast of the Seine, in particular, the pas de calais area, directly opposite Dover, England, rather than in Normandy. At the same time, through the top-secret ultra-operation, the Allies were able to decode encrypted German transmissions, thus providing the overlord forces with a clear picture of where the German counterattack forces were deployed. By spurious radio transmissions, the Allied created an entire phantom army based in southeast England, opposite Potticale, and alleged to be commanded by the American General George S. Patton. Patton would later materialize on the Normandy battlefield to lead the armored breakout into Brittany. In addition, on the night of the invasion itself, airborne radar deception presented to German radar stations a phantom picture of an invasion fleet crossing the Channel Narrows, while a radar blackout disguised the real transit to Normandy. The Germans were not altogether deluded. Hitler himself declared a last-minute premonition of a Normandy landing. By then, however, the dispositions had been made. Rommel, in his brief period of responsibility for the Atlantic Wall, had been able to decouple mine laying, so that by June 5 some 4 million more mines had been laid on the beaches. He had not, however, been able to position the German tank divisions as he wanted. Rundstedt wished to hold them back from the coast as a reserve. Rommel, warning that Allied aircraft would destroy them as they advanced, wished to place them near the beaches. Hitler, adjudicating in the dispute, worsened the situation by allotting some divisions to Rommel and some to Rundstedt, keeping others under his own command. The rest of Rommel's army group B was made up of the infantry divisions of the 7th Army, under Friedrich Dahlmann, in Normandy and Brittany and of the 15th Army, under Hans von Salmuth, in Potticale and eastward. The reserve tank forces, given the name Panzer Group West and commanded by Leo Ger von Schwettenberg, came nominally under Rundstedt's direct command. As the day approached and troops began to embark for the crossing, bad weather set in, threatening dangerous landing conditions. After a tense debate, Eisenhower and his subordinates decided on a 24-hour delay, requiring the recall of some ships already at sea. Allied control of the Atlantic meant German meteorologists had less information than the Allied on incoming weather patterns. As the Luftwaffe Meteorological Center in Paris was predicting two weeks of stormy weather, many Wehrmacht commanders left their posts to attend war games in Rennes, and men in many units were given leave. 
Field Marshal Owen Rommel, in particular, returned to Germany for his wife's birthday and to petition Hitler for additional panzer divisions. Eventually, on the morning of June 5, 1944, Eisenhower, assured by chief meteorologist, James Martin Stagg of a break in the weather, announced, OK. We'll go. He told the troops, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade, toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Within hours an armada of 3,000 landing craft, 2,500 other ships, and 500 naval vessels, escorts and bombardment ships, began to leave English ports. Later that day, more than 5,000 ships and landing craft carrying troops and supplies left England for the trip across the Channel to France, while more than 11,000 aircraft were mobilized to provide air cover and support for the invasion. The landing. By dawn on June 6, thousands of paratroopers and glider troops were already on the ground, securing bridges and exit roads. The amphibious invasions began at 6.30 a.m. M. The British and Canadians overcame light opposition to capture beaches codenamed Gold, Juno and Sword, as did the Americans at Utah Beach, U.S. Forces faced heavy resistance at Omaha Beach, where there were over 2,000 American casualties. However, by day's end, approximately 156,000 Allied troops had successfully stormed Normandy's beaches. According to some estimates, more than 4,000 Allied troops lost their lives in the D-Day invasion, with thousands more wounded or missing. Less than a week later, on June 11th, the beaches were fully secured and over 326,000 troops, more than 50,000 vehicles and some 100,000 tons of equipment had landed at Normandy. For their part, the Germans suffered from confusion in the ranks and the absence of celebrated Commander Rommel, who was away on leave. At first, Hitler, believing the invasion was a faint design to distract the Germans from a coming attack north of the Seine River, refused to release nearby divisions to join the counterattack. Reinforcements had to be called from further afield, causing delays. He also hesitated in calling for armored divisions to help in the defense. Moreover, the Germans were hampered by effective Allied air support, which took out many key bridges and forced the Germans to take long detours, as well as efficient Allied naval support, which helped protect advancing Allied troops. In the ensuing weeks, the Allied fought their way across the Normandy countryside in the face of determined German resistance, as well as a dense landscape of marshes and hedgerows. By the end of June, the Allies had seized the vital port of Cherbourg, landed approximately 850,000 men and 150,000 vehicles in Normandy, and were poised to continue their march inland France. By the end of August 1944, the Allied had reached the Seine River, Paris was liberated and the Germans had been removed from northwestern France, effectively concluding the Battle of Normandy. The Allied forces then prepared to enter Germany, where they would meet up with Soviet troops moving in from the east. Indeed, the Normandy invasion began to turn the tide against the Nazis. A significant psychological blow, it also prevented Hitler from sending troops from France to build up his eastern front against the advancing Soviets. The following spring, on May 8, 1945, the Allied formally accepted the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany. Hitler had committed suicide a week earlier, on April 30th. The Normandy invasion was one of great turning points of 20th century history. An immense army was placed in Nazi-occupied Europe, never to be dislodged. Germany was threatened that same month by a tremendous Soviet invasion from the east that would reach the gates of Berlin by the following April. The way to appreciate D-Day's importance is to contemplate what would have happened if it had failed. Another landing would not have been possible for at least a year. This would have given Hitler time to strengthen the Atlantic Wall, harass England with the newly developed V-1 flying bombs and V-2 rockets, continue to develop jet aircraft and other so-called miracle weapons, and finish off his campaign against ethnic and racial undesirables.